Well, hello, and welcome to this discussion about uh, modernist architecture in Poland and Central Europe, and with some uh, discussion, some notice of the repercussions that had and the connections that had uh, across the rest of Europe, because modernism, of course, made a lot of noise about being a genuinely international movement. Indeed, it was seen in some ways as an antidote to the various forms of nationalistic styles which had emerged in Europe in the later part of the 19th century and in the early 20th century, that modernism based on the universality of humankind would be international. It would have the same basic implications, the same forms, the same meaning even, the same functions, whether it was in uh, Eastern Europe, whether it was in Central Europe, whether it was in the Mediterranean, or whether it was in Northern Europe or even Northwestern Europe in, in the United Kingdom. Um, now, of course, that is a little bit of a fiction that almost every European country had its own iteration of modernism. Uh, in, in France, that may have been dominated by Le Corbusier, but there were other significant practitioners like André Lursa uh, and uh, Malle Stevens. Uh, of course, in Germany, there were numerous movements and counter movements, some of them coalescing around the Bauhaus, uh, which had several different heads, each of whom took a different view. Um, in Italy, you have the work of the rationalists of Giuseppe Terragni, and then later uh, Banfi Belgiorgioso, uh, Perisiti and Rogers. Uh, and uh, in Austria, again, there was something quite different going on, whether it was Adolf Loos, or whether it was the architects who built buildings like the Karl Marx Hof, the great housing project as part of Red Vienna. And then uh, as the British architect, F.R.S. York uh, calls it in his book, The Modern House, there were some very strange experiments in the Soviet Union about which he knew virtually nothing. And then of course, modernism uh, goes outside Europe as well uh, in various forms, not perhaps in a direct line. It uh, took root in the United States. There were outposts in Japan, certainly important outposts in South America and even in South Africa. So modernism was very much an international movement, but what we're going to look at um, is some quite specific regional iterations of modernism. And we've got two uh, scholars who will help us do this. Uh, speaking first is Dr. Michel Vignesky, who is an architectural historian. Uh, he teaches uh, at the Economic University of Krakow, and he also worked at the International Co uh, Cultural Center in Krakow, uh, where he has uh, curated exhibitions on this sort of theme. And he's written a number of books about uh, Polish architects, both before and after the Second World War. And some of their careers, of course, span that period, because just uh, whatever the traumas of Poland went through between 1939 and 1989 doesn't mean that architects somehow uh, were completely cleared out and the new bunch uh, 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 were, were introduced. Uh, so uh, well, I'm going to ask him uh, to start by saying a few words about what we might understand by modernism in Poland and in particular uh, it, in, in, as part of uh, Central Europe. Hello, um, good morning. My name is Michał Wisniewski. Thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, being invited uh, in this very interesting um, uh, discussion. Um, <clears throat> I should say that uh, 1918 uh, constitute a completely new situation, political, geopolitical situation in Central Europe, namely establishment of more than a dozen new countries uh, from Estonia to uh, Kingdom of um, uh, Serbia, Croatia and Slovenia. And uh, uh, there were some certain uh, needs and some certain uh, ideas dedicated to modernization of uh, this very region. Uh, these ideas uh, were played and uh, presented mainly by the new nation states that uh, to a certain extent uh, played a specific game uh, named um, uh, who is the most modern in the region. And this very game uh, was presented through infrastructure uh, and through architecture. And architecture in the 20s and 30s uh, played an enormously important role. Uh, when you look at Bucharest, when you look at uh, the cities of the former Czechoslovakia, uh, when you look at Poland, uh, 
uh, you will find many uh, really intriguing uh, projects and programs of modernity, uh, sometimes, but not always, linked with modernism. Uh, when we talk about uh, architecture of the region, uh, one should start with the fact that establishment of new states uh, completely reshaped the map. So there was some certain need to present that we Poles, we Czechoslovaks are here, and this is the territory that we are living in. Uh, so uh, you can find until today uh, some uh, particular cities or places uh, with uh, very important buildings dedicated to historical events or dedicated to national mythology. Sometimes as well to the big battles of the World War I, where Poles, Hungarians, uh, Czechs, Slovaks, Romanians uh, were fighting and dying. Uh, so this is the very beginning layer of, let's say, uh, discussion about architecture in this region. Uh, the second layer uh, would be the establishment of the new capital cities. For instance, the city of Warsaw. Before the World War I, it was a city of uh, more than 700,000 inhabitants. A very uh, big one and among the biggest in the uh, what used to be a, a Tsarist Russian Empire. But uh, it wasn't... A, how to say a capital city. It wasn't a city of, let's say, political significance. Uh, after the World War I, or actually during the World War I, the situation changed entirely. And in the 1920s and 30s, you can find a transformation of Warsaw into a capital city with monumental space, with the new urban uh, programs, sometimes on a very large uh, scale. And uh, especially in the late 20s and during the 1930s, linked uh, with the very strong attempt to present the state of Poland as a modern one. Uh, so this was this element of the competition in between of the state. In Poland, uh, modernism uh, was uh, in many ways uh, melted uh, in a pot with some need to present the tradition. Between the World War I, there was no Poland on the map. Uh, Poland was divided into three partitions. A part of the country was uh, administrated by Germany, a part by Austria, Austro-Hungarian Empire, and a part by Russia. So for more than 100 years, uh, uh, you can find many uh, elements of architecture presenting these uh, dominant uh, states. Uh, there were some very big gaps in between of infrastructure, uh, completely different uh, rail system, completely different uh, road systems. And in the 20s and 30s, uh, Poland uh, was very dedicated uh, and focusing on the um, overcoming those uh, differences, establishing one state with one capital city, but also with some new regional uh, cities like Gdynia uh, at the Baltic Sea uh, shore, uh, as well as the city of Katowice, a very important uh, industrial uh, city in the region of Upper Silesia. So uh, from the perspective of Poland, it was very important to present the new symbolics uh, that uh, uh, could present Poland as a country that used to exist, that its history is uh, that can trace me back to the medieval times, but uh, the country that uh, is also very modern oriented. To a certain extent, uh, you can find representation of uh, this kind of approach uh, <clears throat> in the architecture of Poland, of course, but also uh, in the uh, national pavilions of Poland represented, uh, presented uh, in the international exhibitions, especially the uh, Paris exhibition of 1925. Uh, Exposition Internationale de Art Decorative et Industrie Moderne uh, is, is the one that you can find, uh, that you can find Polish pavilion, uh, where on the one hand side, uh, you can find some elements of the typical manor house uh, from the 18th century, but also there is a huge glass dome uh, topping uh, the whole construction. Uh, this very uh, pavilion was granted with the Grand Prix of the exhibition. So somehow uh, 
uh, this um, uh, project was found uh, interesting. Uh, on the other hand side, uh, France was very supporting Poland uh, in many ways. So this was maybe another reason uh, of this uh, success. But anyway, um, this very project was very talkative and representative for the needs of Poland. Uh, and uh, when you look at the region, you can find many similar uh, projects. Uh, when you go to Prague, to Fratschany Castle, you can see that this uh, Kafkian space uh, of this omnipotent state represented by the castle uh, is uh, turning into a more, let's say, democratic uh, and uh, inclusive space open for the entire societies of uh, Czechia and of Slovakia. Uh, when you look at the Josef Lechnik project at Hrachan, you can find some symbols representing uh, the culture, uh, namely the view to the panorama of Prague, as well as you can find some symbols representing the nature, uh, namely the symbols of the Tatra mountains representing the Slovakia part of the union. And uh, uh, on the one hand side, such projects were very dedicated to the modernism, modern construction, modern, let's say, symbols of uh, design. But on the other hand side, you can find uh, these elements of topography, of geography, and of the history. So um, it's uh, always uh, a kind of a problem of negotiation in between of modernity and tradition. Uh, this is, I would say, the most important phenomena of the Central European uh, way of uh, dealing with modernism and with modernity. Thank you very much, Michal. Uh, can I just ask a couple of uh, uh, quick questions um, about the, the, the architects who were practicing in, in Krakow, in, in, in Silesia, but also across Poland? Um, who, who were they? And were they, uh, how did they become modernist architects? I mean, how were they educated? What was it that made them turn to modernism rather than any other way of making architecture? Uh, the history of modernism uh, in Krakow, but I would say also in other cities of Poland, uh, might be traced back to the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, at least in Krakow, at that time, you can find uh, a quite strong group of architects uh, very dedicated to Art Nouveau, and they represented uh, the entire, uh, let's say, uh, they represented uh, a big variety of uh, European schools of architecture. Zurich, uh, Munich, uh, Karlsruhe, Vienna, but also St. Petersburg, and last but not least, many of them studied in Lviv, today uh, in Western Ukraine. At that time, it was a capital city of the Kingdom of Galicia, which was a part of Austro-Hungarian Empire. So uh, the Technical University of Lviv, it was at that time, at the turn of the 19th and the 20th century, the only school, technical school with the Polish language uh, as, a, as a main one. And uh, this school already at the end of the 19th century was very interested in, for instance, reinforced concrete, uh, but also in general with the modern, let's say, uh, technical uh, opportunities um, of, of, of that time. Uh, so uh, this was, let's say, the first generation of the architects uh, presenting uh, some interest in modernism. Uh, they were born mainly in the uh, 1870s, 1880s. And uh, in the 1920s, uh, many of them played very important role uh, in the life of the so-called Second Republic of Poland. It also needs to be uh, mentioned that some of them uh, became at the time very important politicians of the Second Republic of Poland. Some of them being very involved in the Polish army uh, during the World War I and later on, some of them played uh, some role in the political life, uh, inviting their friends to design uh, important uh, state buildings in Warsaw, in Katowice, uh, in Krakow, and, and among the other cities. But uh, I should also say that in the 1916, still during the World War I, uh, Poland saw establishment of the new school of architecture, this time in Warsaw. And uh, this very school, uh, since its very beginning, was very uh, 
Western European and modern oriented. Already in the early 20s, the group of students from this school from Warsaw decided to go to Paris to meet with Le Corbusier. And uh, already in the early 20s, you can see this school as a very avant-garde uh, oriented. So in the late uh, 20s, uh, once graduated, they started to play the most important role in the life of Warsaw architecture and later on of Polish architecture, uh, proposing some uh, cutting edge modern uh, design, people like uh, Helena and Szymon uh, Circus, Barbara uh, and Stanisław Brukalski, uh, among the others, uh, they were the group of the younger generation, uh, uh, very interested uh, in the housing architecture, uh, mainly left-wing, uh, politically oriented. And uh, they, they saw on the one hand side modernism as a um, architecture style, uh, but uh, at first it was a kind of a uh, political position, I would say. They were using architecture for, let's say, better life of the society, not necessarily for um, expression of the nation state. And that took them close to the sort of international essence of, of modernism through um, the Congress International d'Architecture Moderne, because I believe the circuses were quite involved with that from quite early days, certainly by 1933. Yeah, uh, Shimon Circus, uh, he was already in the second meeting as far as, far as I remember. And he was also in this uh, Frankfurt exhibition about the smallest possible uh, house. Uh, so uh, they were very involved and uh, especially the fourth meeting, the one from Marseille, to Athens, uh, where the Athens Charter was uh, prepared, uh, was the one when you can observe not only them, not only circuses, but also some other uh, architects from Poland be being involved. And uh, once the Athens Charter was uh, prepared, um, among the first urban projects, modern urban projects, that were following the Athens Charter, uh, one should mention the new plan for Warsaw, 1934, the modern Warsaw. Uh, it was a regional plan uh, presenting the uh, long-term development of the city, uh, closely related to the nature, uh, closely related to the modern infrastructure seen in the regional, but also in the state, I would say even uh, scale. And uh, you can see a kind of a uh, zoning uh, implemented to this uh, plan, uh, dividing housing from other uh, functions in the city and giving the space for the metropolitan uh, development of, uh, of Warsaw. At that time, it was a very modern uh, way of thinking. And uh, maybe last information, at that time, about 80% of the population of the Second Republic of Poland lived in the countryside. So uh, from this perspective, it was uh, a very big uh, step forward. Good. Well, thank you very much. We'll come back to, uh, to you in conversation. Uh, but now it's a very great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Joseph Reichwert, um, who is one of the most distinguished architectural historians of his generation. Um, but he was born in Poland, indeed in Warsaw, and he grew up there and has memories of modernism uh, in the, certainly by the 1930s. Uh, but of course, most of his career has been outside uh, Poland. He studied architecture and architectural history uh, in the UK at uh, the Bartlett School of Architecture as part of University College London, and also, uh, at the Architectural Association. He then taught in Ulm. He taught at the new British University in uh, University of Essex uh, before moving to uh, University of Pennsylvania where he is now a professor emeritus. And he's written many books, but perhaps the one we should mention here is a book called The First Moderns because it is shortly being published for the first time uh, in Polish. Now, the first moderns are not the modernists we've been talking about designing buildings in Poland in the 1920s and the 1930s, because uh, Joseph sees 
uh, the, the roots of modernism as being in the 18th, even the 17th century, when you start to get a new uh, sense of the importance of science and scientific thinking and new ideas start to come about uh, through that. And those ideas begin to affect architecture, particularly uh, neoclassicism, which as I understand it became a very big uh, idea, very big influence in Poland in the 18th century before it was partitioned and in effect as a political entity erased from the map to be administered as Michel uh, told us by three different powers, by Russia, by Austro-Hungary uh, and by Prussia, which then of course becomes um, uh, Germany in the 1870s. And only then in 1918, after the First World War, does Poland become re-established as a political entity and as a state. Um, although of course, Polish culture, Polish language uh, had survived all that admittedly in very difficult circumstances. So I'm, I'm going to uh, start a, a conversation with uh, Joseph about, the, uh, about modernism uh, in Poland and perhaps beyond. Uh, but Joseph, you were saying earlier that you remember going to an exhibition with your father about a plan for Warsaw uh, which we have just referenced now. Could you we've, tell us? We've just been talking about it. Yes. Could you tell us say, what your memories of it were? Pardon? Well, could you say something about your memories of that exhibition and that and that plan? I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not with you. Could, could I say something about how you personally remember that that plan? Well, my introduction to more, to modernism in Poland was really through a literary weekly called Literary News, which had an office around the corner from my school. And they had every couple of weeks, every new issue, they had a big paper sculpture in the, in the window of the editorial offices. And they were very intriguing. They were my first experience of modern art. Yeah. It, it was actually a, a literary and artistic paper, so it, it carried quite a lot of material about the visual arts. Mm. Um, it was very much part of the discussion in Poland at the time. And there were a number of groups um, practicing more or less abstract art in the new way of, of Russian constructivism and, and the style. Mm. But the architecture, as has just been said, was largely dominated by a small group of architects who are connected, who are connected to Siam, mm. of whom the circuses were most important, and they're also rather important in Siam itself, in the International Congress of Modern Architecture, because they were in fact the people who more or less um, edited if not wrote what was called the Athens Charter for various reasons, which was uh, in fact the main programma programmatic uh, publication of Siam. So we've had quite a lot about the circuses already. Uh, I met them when I was grown up. I didn't know them as a child. I met them in uh, at the it's CM Congress in Bergamo in, in 19, I think, 1949, I think, or 1950, I think 49. And Helena then very much encouraged me to go come back to Poland. And as I didn't comply, I think she rather lost interest in me. Yeah. So w uh, in uh, Poland, as a boy in Warsaw, you were aware of a sort of sense of modernist culture, but perhaps less in architecture uh, than in uh, uh, literature and in other visual arts. Uh, when did, did you, in, in Warsaw, were there many examples of modernist building in the 1930s? There weren't very many. There were mostly housing projects and, um, I think there was a kind of moderate modernism, which was 
prevalent in Poland. Um, Warsaw is very much at, at first a timber and then a brick city. Um, not much stone. So um, it was a, a plastered city. Um, and it was very much a stuccoed, stuccoed rather than plastered city. So it, <clears throat> the, uh, the structures were on the whole rather covered over. Um, but the, what was prevalent in, in the Warsaw suburbs was a kind of moderate modernism, um, not going as far as the surfaces, um, and uh, still redolent of the new classicism of, of the old city. So uh, we heard from uh, Michal that the, um, one of the, the points about Warsaw was that it had not really been a capital city before 1918, and it has to become a capital city of, of the new country or the re-established country of, of Poland. Now, well, where... it really is rather an artificial situation, of course, because Poland was two countries, the, the Kingdom of Poland, which is with the capital in Krakow, and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania with the capital in Vilno. And then in the 17th century, Sigismund III, who was actually Swedish father, um, decided to unite the two capitals in Warsaw, which was not quite halfway, but it was certainly on the route between, between Vilno and Warsaw. So Warsaw was like Madrid, in an artificial capital for uniting the two countries. Yes, yes, yes. But in the, in the 1920s and, and 30s, did, did some of the buildings that were built to mark the, the, its new status as the capital, were they modernist or were they, uh, as, as you said, a sort of middle of the road um, modernism uh, that, that perhaps wasn't the uh, fully-fledged modernism of Le Corbusier and, and his school? It's sort of middle-of-the-road modernism, yes. Um, I think the, the housing around where we live was exactly that. Hmm. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, one thing I think that, it, that is perhaps uh, better known about Poland uh, between the wars than many other aspects of, of Poland between the wars uh, is the quality of its scientific thinking, uh, because uh, it was uh, Polish mathematicians who did a lot of the fundamental mathematical work that led to the code breaking uh, of the Enigma Code during the Second World War. Was there also a scientific modernism, a technical modernism? I mean, we heard a little bit from Michal about the interest in the School of Architecture and Lvov in new materials or then new materials like reinforced concrete. But I'm thinking, you know, as, as a sort of cultural level, at the level of the um, 18th century thinkers uh, alluded to in the first moderns who are redefining um, mathematics and, and, and setting a new basis for science. Was there, uh, was there an awareness of that happening in Warsaw in the 1920s and 30s? Well, um, the heroic figure was Marie Curie Skłodowska, who was one of the discoverers of radium. Um, and, but there wasn't a, there was not a scientific um, advanced group to parallel that of the mathematicians and logicians. Mm. It was that which was the strength of Polish scientific thinking in between the wars. Yes. Uh, and what, what would, would you point to any significant buildings as being exemplars of what we might call a Polish modernism uh, dating from the 1920s and 30s? Well, for instance, there's a big student hostel not far from where we live um, on the Narutowicza Square, um, which represents a kind of um, subpask modernism. Right. And does that still survive? Uh, 
I think not. Right. Because, of course, Warsaw was very badly damaged in 1940. It was indeed, yes. I may add one thing. This building survived. Oh, definitely. Yes. Actually, this very part of the city uh, wasn't destroyed. I mean, the neighborhood of the Narutovica uh, Square, and uh, it's still there. Right, right. Um, and can, can we talk a little bit about how uh, the careers continue? Because, of course, the, the, political diff uh, the political circumstances of Poland are very different in the 1920s and 30s to the 19, late 1940s and 50s and 60s. Um, but of course, uh, and apart from uh, the circuses, who we've, as, as Joseph says, we've talked about quite a lot, um, there must have been other architects who were practicing both before and after the Second World War. Could you say a few words about their careers and how they changed, if they indeed did change, uh, in the, after the Second World War uh, to before the Second World War? Well, I'm afraid the circuses, who were the leaders of modernism in the 30s, became the leading Stalinists um, in, in the, the end of the 40s, early 50s. Um, so they, they rather sold out on their modernism mm. and to which they returned after things had changed. But by then a new generation was taking, was taking charge. And I think Oscar Hansen was probably the most talented of them. And yet Sultan was the second. Sultan actually went and worked for Corbusier uh, in, in Paris for about four or five years. And then became the site architect for Corbusier's buildings at Harvard. And stayed there as chair of the architecture department. Yes. But he also worked in Poland yes. and in America. Yes, yes. Um, what about, were, were there other architects who, whose careers span that, uh, that, that uh, time frame, Michal? Sorry. Uh, well, um, I should say that uh, uh, only some of them survived the war. Uh, we should uh, emphasize this very issue. Uh, before the war, for instance, there were many uh, architects of the Jewish origin. Actually, Shimon Sirkus, uh, he was also of the Jewish origins and uh, he was arrested during the war and sent to Auschwitz. Uh, he survived as one of the very few. Uh, but uh, there were so many who died during the Holocaust. Uh, in Krakow, um, uh, for instance, uh, uh, I would like to mention one architect whose name was Alfred Dintuch. He was responsible for this middle of the road modernism, very elegant uh, tenement houses designed in a modern way. In the beginning of the war, in the beginning of September 1939, he escaped Krakow uh, with his family and moved to Sao Paulo. And after the war, he was very active there, uh, designing one of the first skyscrapers in this very city. Uh, and he was not the only one who moved away uh, to Brazil, to United States, uh, to, to, to Palestine, and, to, uh, and later on Israel. Uh, that's another uh, issue. Uh, but uh, besides of those who survived or those who died, um, uh, we can find uh, a variety of, let's say, uh, cases. There were many architects who, after the war, uh, wanted to be involved in, let's say, reconstruction, no matter of the political situation of the country. And it's right now very easy to say that they were somehow compromised or, let's say, supported communist regime. But uh, uh, there were plenty of them who decided just to uh, be a part of reconstruction of Warsaw or other cities in Poland. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some who decided to be involved in, let's say, uh, reconstruction of education and uh, uh, formation of the new generation of architects. Uh, for instance, in Krakow, uh, one of the most prominent in the 20s and 30s, his name was Adolf Szyszko Bohusz. He studied in St. Petersburg before the World War I. In the 20s and 30s, he was among the most prominent architects in the Second Republic of Poland. Uh, when the war, when the Second World War started, he decided to stay in Krakow. After the war, uh, he survived the war. And after the war, he established the new school of architecture 
and uh, what is today education of architecture in Krakow uh, is continuing his ideas, his thoughts, and uh, really like to present the tradition of this very personality. Uh, in, 1940, uh, in 1948, he was put into some kind of oblivion. After the war, there were many suspicious around him that he was supporting Nazis, which was not true, uh, but uh, it, it, it was one of the uh, prices, it was one of the examples of the people that had to sacrifice somehow uh, to be still active uh, in the conditions of the uh, communist uh, Poland. Uh, what I want to say is that there was no one uh, example of the uh, career that you could do in the post-war Poland. Uh, there were plenty of ways, but uh, uh, there was also plenty of, let's say, uh, negative examples of the people who were simply put to the margin. Uh, for instance, there were some uh, very prominent uh, Warsaw architects who after the war <laughs> were sent to Krakow as a sacrifice, uh, and they were not allowed to practice anymore, but they were allowed to teach. Uh, so this is uh, one another uh, case uh, of what was going on with uh, modern architects after the war. Uh, well, so this is my answer. Yeah, I mean, it seems to me that there are some parallels between Poland in the late 1940s and, and the UK. I mean, forget the different political situation, but uh, in Britain, a lot of young architects, often born in the second decade of the 20th century, so they're still only in their 30s in the late 1940s, are actively involved in reconstructing some of the most damaged cities, of which perhaps the, the most obvious example is Coventry, which was, um, that had the most complete destruction, but also, of course, London and any of the other big cities that had suffered from bombing. Um, and most of them uh, appointed... Um, chief uh, architects who were quite young to be in that sort of role. In, in London, for example, the chief architect of the London County Council was first Robert Matthew and then Leslie Martin, both of whom became very important, um, both practitioners and educationalists. Um, but, 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 but thinking really about the sort of urge for young architects, many of whom had um, served in the military uh, during the Second World War, quite often within the engineering corps, so they're involved in building things, or as one of my former professors said, he, he had studied engineering, he was taught as a very young man how to make bridges stand up, and then in his mid-twenties he had to learn how to blow them up um, as, an, as an engineer, so he saw the, the design of bridges from both ends. But the, the, I, I just wonder whether there was any awareness, whether there was any sort of interchange other than through SIAM uh, of what was happening in the reconstruction of cities in Poland and cities in the United Kingdom. Uh, well, of course, in, in the 40s, there was a Polish School of Architecture in Liverpool, which was quite active. But the graduates on the whole turn, uh, turned to Poland bringing with them ideas which they formed in, in this country. So there was a, a kind of connection which was, which had a very definite influence in Poland at the time. And of course, one of the big influences in, in the Liverpool University School of Architecture uh, was William Holford, who was in, in, William Holford, who was in many yeah. ways the, the uh, or certainly one of the leading figures in urban reconstruction after after the Second World War in the UK. So, so that really reinforces your point, Joseph, about the importance of the Polish Liverpool School of Architecture, I guess, and, and urban reconstruction um, as, a, as a point of, of, of reference. The other Polish figure who is now largely forgotten was Maciej Nowicki, who became the first plan of Chandigarh and died in a, in a plane accident who um, went Corbusier to Max Fry in Jane Rue and then Corbusier took over. Hmm. Yeah, so, so in, indeed the, the influence of uh, uh, Polish uh, architects and urban designers goes way beyond 
Poland and the reconstruction of Polish cities. It, it, it's involved in the, uh, it has some influence in the United Kingdom, but also, as you're saying, in one of the great modernist urban visions of the 1950s in Chandigarh. Yeah. So uh, that's, that, that's interesting. So a, a little bit more perhaps about this di diaspora of, of Polish architects. We've heard about people who went to Sao Paulo, uh, went to India, uh, came to the UK. Uh, were there any other sites? I mean, uh, Michal, you mentioned an architect who had worked in uh, Iraq, for example, a Polish architect. Uh, well, I would say that um, when you look at the Polish architecture post-war, uh, at first you can find this great joy of uh, independence, liberalization, end of the war. At that time, uh, many people like uh, Maciej Nowicki, just mentioned by Joseph Rickford, uh, they represented the need of reconstruction uh, following the modern uh, ideas and modern design. And uh, 1945, Nowicki, he presented um, a really avant-garde uh, project for the reconstruction of Warsaw. I would say it uh, would not be accepted <laughs> by a majority of the society, but was really uh, significant. Uh, already in 1945, Nowitzki was sent to US uh, to be a Polish uh, partner in design of the United Nations headquarters. Uh, and yeah. uh, that's how he go there and he stayed uh, in US. Uh, so the first years uh, after the war, it was this moment when you could still be modern. Uh, the communists, they did not control everything in the state and architecture was not uh, the most important target. Everything has changed after 1948, uh, when, uh, when already the Stalinists in the Polish party took control over everything. In 1949, you can observe the establishment of the so-called socialist realism uh, in the Polish architecture following the ideas and patterns, uh, patterns of the Soviet uh, Union uh, architecture. And uh, you can find a lot of his architecture in Warsaw, first of all, uh, like Palace of Culture, the second tallest, biggest building of Europe at the time after the Womonosov University in Moscow. Uh, you can find Nova Huta estate in Krakow, another very intriguing uh, uh, ensemble. But uh, talking about this connection with the uh, global south, let's call it this way, uh, I should say that the crucial moment was 1956 and the Khrushchev speech, after which uh, we can observe the toe, uh, the end of the Stalinism. Uh, on the level of the political system, uh, something has changed. Not much, but something has changed after 1956. Uh, it was a different country, more liberal, liberal but still a communist one. Uh, but uh, what has really changed was the culture. S uh, Stalinism and the socialist, re uh, socialist realism uh, gone, and uh, you can observe like a second wave of this joyment of being modern. Uh, and uh, this, let's say, uh, new um, approach towards the modernism post-1956 uh, was in somehow connected with, let's say, growing openness of the communist Poland towards the uh, countries uh, that were emerging in Africa uh, or in Asia uh, because of the process of decolonization. Uh, Poland, the communist Poland, was among the first countries in the world that recognized the independence of the People's Republic of China. And among the first countries in the world that started to collaborate with the countries like Ghana, uh, Algiers, uh, Iraq, um, among the others. Uh, talking about Krakow architecture, I should say that uh, the local uh, architecture companies uh, that were involved in the early 1950s in the construction of Nova Huta, the biggest Stalinist ensemble uh, of the era in Krakow and one of the biggest in Poland. After 1956, they became like the export companies uh, being involved in the big projects in Syria, in Iraq, in Algiers. When you will go to Algier, uh, to the capital of the country, you can still see the big monument for the heroes fighting for independence. It was designed by the Krakow-based uh, sculptor, Marian Konieczny. 
but uh, you ask about Iraq. Uh, it's fact that in the early 60s, uh, Krakow-based company, Miasto Project, was involved in the uh, design of the project of the master plan of the city. And later on in the 70s and in the 80s, they were designing the more and more detailed projects uh, for the city of Baghdad, the, mainly the housing one, but also they design a large scale project of um, uh, housing scheme for the whole country, for the 12 million of people, which was something really amazing uh, at that time in, in Poland and uh, such uh, connections. Uh, with Cuba, with Afghanistan, uh, with Vietnam, uh, they, they were uh, maybe not uh, the most important phenomena of the Polish architecture of that time, but they were quite significant. And until today in Poland, you can find many architects involved uh, in collaboration with Iraq or with Syria or with Libya. Uh, Gaddafi was another very important ally of Poland of that era. So it's interesting to almost to get the best opportunities, Polish architects had to work outside Poland, even well, they had a lot of opportunities in the country as well. <laughs> but I, I'm just thinking that quite often in oppressive regimes, um, it's quite difficult for architects to achieve very much because the, the you know, architecture has to be backed by a system of power, a system of finance. Um, whereas if you're a musical composer or a poet, um, you can, even if you have to, as uh, Shostakovich did, turn out the odd symphony to celebrate the, the 1917 revolution or something like that. You could do write your string quartets or smaller scale works that could be uh, performed privately uh, as, as a personal tribute. As an architect, it's very difficult to do that unless you focus on drawings or on very small scale things. And I'm thinking... Uh, of, of someone like Alexander Brodsky in, in, in Moscow, who produced a series of really remarkable you know, drawings in the 1970s and 80s, um, because he couldn't build what he wants to build. Um, and I wonder if the people in Poland like that, who were you know, developing a sort of paper architecture, a theoretical architecture, I would say this is a phenomenon of the 1980s. Uh, in the early, in the in the late 1970s, Poland already uh, approached the massive economical crisis, which stopped down the uh, construction market uh, for a very long period of time. And in the 80s, you can find a new generation, uh, the post-war generation of architecture uh, of architects, uh, who had not much to to do. And uh, it was 1981 uh, when Warsaw, so the uh, conference of the International Union of Architects, uh, a very big event, very important event. Uh, uh, and uh, at that time, you can see like the uh, underground movement of young architects presenting their charter, Warsaw Charter. Uh, very uh, negative towards what was going on in the Polish architecture in the previous years and somehow promoting the postmodernism uh, in the Polish architecture. So in the 1980s, you can find a lot of this uh, paper archi architecture uh, going on. Uh, there were also some, uh, let's say, uh, futuristic architecture already in the 70s. Uh, Oscar Hansen, to a certain extent, uh, could be seen as a futurist architect. In the 60s, he was uh, preparing projects for the linear cities. Uh, he saw the development of the urban planning in Poland through the four 800 long, uh, 800 kilometers long uh, cities from the mountains to the seashore. Uh, but there were uh, some other architects uh, who proposed some uh, really amazing uh, projects, uh, especially in the 70s. And in the 80s, it turned into, let's say, a postmodern um, approach, mm -hmm. which on one hand side uh, was represented by this paper architecture. And on the other hand side, what was quite, let's say, local uh, phenomenon, in the 80s, Poland saw establishment of more than 2,000 new churches, Roman Catholic churches, and some of them uh, were representing this postmodern as well, postmodernism yeah. as well. And of course, that's when there was a Polish Pope. Uh, 
Well, uh, of course, there was this, let's say, religious moment of the 1980s. Uh, Pope was important, but also the solidarity movement was important. And uh, churches were the places of, let's say, meetings uh, at that time. And uh, I, I'm going to uh, start to draw things to a conclusion, uh, but uh, turn to back to Joseph, because uh, uh, Joseph, you were, I guess, observing or, or at least aware of what was happening in Poland from outside, from the United Kingdom or from the US. Um, were you uh, aware of these movements in the 1980s, this sort of paper theoretical based architecture? Yes, I was. Uh, and my contact was really through an architect who was also a politician, Czesław Bielecki who uh, started an office called House and City, Domi Miasto, and who's still working, and very, indeed very active. But I think um, uh, his stylistic affinities were very ambiguous. Right. Well, thank you very much both to Professor Joseph Reichwert and to Michal uh, Wieniecki uh, for uh, a fascinating uh, disquisition about uh, that we've gone way beyond both the boundaries of Poland and the time frame of the 1920s and 30s. But I hope we've shown how some of these uh, greater developments uh, originate because of what was happening in Poland in the immediate aftermath of the First World War and how um, under that extraordinary um, uh, outpouring of, of national consciousness that, re, uh, that accompanied the re-establishment of Poland as, a, as an independent nation, um, led to all sorts of opportunities and ways of thinking about architecture that helped both to um, establish Polish independence and then to re-establish the nature of Polish cities after the Second World War, but also both through the work of Siam, but also perhaps more importantly, through the work of individual architects in individual locations across the world, showing that what was happening in Poland in a crucial period in its history, actually in architectural terms, has implications and significance across the world. Uh, so I hope you've enjoyed this discussion. I would like uh, finally to thank um, uh, the Polish Cultural Institute for making this possible and uh, Natalia Polchowska uh, and to Jan Halonieski who has uh, um, uh, facilitated the technology for this. But finally to say thank you to both uh, Joseph and to Michal. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much. Thank you. For upcoming events, please visit our website and follow us on social media.